Okay, how's everyone doing this morning? Great. How's it, how about everybody else besides Ken? Good. <laughs> Amen to that. Yes. Open your Bibles, if you would, to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy. And today... Dare I say it, we're going to officially wrap up the series that we've been doing on when and where Paul wrote his various epistles. The reason I say dare I say it is that <laughs> you know how that goes, right? But um, I guess I should put the mic on. Up. <laughs> Alright, we don't have the PA working this morning, so you'll just have to kind of bear with my scratchy throat this morning. <laughs> I'm going to start at uh, 1 Timothy 1 and look at verse 3. 1 Timothy 1, 3, it says this. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge son to teach no other doctrine and so on. Let's, let's have a word of prayer. Our gracious God and Father, we are thankful that we can spend some time in your word, grateful that we can sing the songs of the faith and, and be reminded that we're saved to the uttermost. That as finished as the work of Christ was on the cross, that's how saved we are. Amen. And Father, we indeed thank you for that blessed truth. And we do pray for insight and wisdom as we look into your word this morning. In Christ's name, amen. Okay, so let's just uh, kind of summarize what we've done so far over how many weeks and how many lessons and so forth. We've been looking at some highlights in the book of Acts for the purpose of identifying you know, when and where the Apostle Paul wrote his epistles. Generally speaking, Paul's epistles are broken up into two categories. One category they refer to as pre-prison, and then the other category they refer to as Paul's prison epistles. Although, as we've seen, that the group that they grouped together as Paul's prison epistles, some of those epistles he wrote while he was not in prison. However, having said that, if we would take a few minutes just to kind of remind ourselves about some things, which books comprise what we would refer to as Paul's pre-prison epistles and in what order were they written? Anybody want to remember? Okay, yes, if you go Paul's pre-prison. He writes Galatians. About where? Where does where he write Galatians? Acts 16. Yeah, very early in Acts 16. Okay, then what does he write next? First, you got first and second S. And he writes those where? Acts 18. Okay, Acts 18. And then what does he write next? You got first uh, and second. Let, let's do it differently because um, where does he write First Corinthians approximately? Acts 19. And then where does he write Second Corinthians? 20. Yeah, Acts 20 and about verse 1 along in there. Okay. And then where does he write Romans? Acts 20, verse 3. Yes, you got Romans and also Acts 20 and about verse 3, about along there. So these are Paul's pre prison epistles. You got Galatians, 1 Thessalonians, 1 Corinthians, Romans. Then when you come over, which books are left at this point? Mm -hmm. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. And, and so, based upon our study, when is it that he wrote? Which, which books does he write next, basically, after this? Okay, he would write the feet, he wrote Ephesians. Oops, let me just do He writes Ephesians, Colossians, and Philippians. And then he writes Philippians, and Philemon, okay? He writes those books while, most likely, uh, while he's at his first imprisonment in Rome. There is some debate and discussion as to whether or not Paul actually did suffer two prison Roman imprisonments. As we're going to see this morning, it almost, it almost demands that he suffered two separate Roman imprisonments. But there are those that, there's some that think it was just one, and therefore, 
at that one Roman imprisonment, he wrote all the remainder books, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, and so forth. Um, but it appears from the information contained in the books, for sure, when he writes Ephesians, he's in bonds. When he writes Colossians, for sure he's in bonds. When he writes Philippians, he's still in bonds, but he's pretty sure he's getting out. When he writes Philemon, he's still in bonds, but he's getting out. Okay? Well, so, so that leaves which books? It leaves which, which books? You've got 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. Those books there. So we're going to look briefly at those this morning to see if we can determine. First of all, let's determine whether Paul is in bonds or not while he's writing those books. Second, let's see if we can determine approximately when he wrote those books. So if you go back with me to 1 Timothy chapter 1, look at 1 Timothy 1 and verse 3. He says this, As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Okay, from reading that, can you tell, is the Apostle Paul, does it sound like he's in bonds or he's, or he's traveling? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, he's, he's obviously moving around. So, that would mean that you either have to place the writing of 1 Timothy before his Roman imprisonment, or you have to say that he indeed did get out was traveling around and wrote it during that time. I see some puzzle looks out there, but any questions on that? If when he writes 1 Timothy, he is traveling around, so he's not in bonds, then you'd have to say he wrote 1 Timothy either before Acts 28, before he's in bonds there, or you'd have to say he in fact did get out of prison, like he thought, was moving around and is free to write this book. So how would you know? How, how would you know? Any ideas? The reading thing what happened. Yeah, okay, yeah, exactly. So like when, when he writes Ephesians, how do you know he is in bonds when he writes Ephesians? Because he says so. He's an ambassador in bonds. He says he's a prisoner of Jesus Christ. How do you know when he writes Colossians that he's in bonds when he writes the book? Because he says the same things in the Bible, in bonds. How do you know when he writes Philippians he's in bonds? Because he says so. Same with Philemon. But when you read the book of 1 Timothy, that he doesn't say anywhere that he's in bonds. There's no indication at all. When he writes 1 Timothy, he's obviously traveling around. So based upon... 1 Timothy 1.3 Where has Paul been and where was he going? In, in 3, 1.3 He was at Ephesus and he leaves Timothy at Ephesus and then where does he go? He goes to Macedonia. So, question. During the book of Acts so prior to Paul's Roman imprisonment was Paul ever at Ephesus? And if so, when and where? Prior to the book of, prior to Acts 28, prior to Paul's Roman imprisonment, was he ever at Ephesus? Yes. Yes. 19. Acts 19. He's, uh, at least a couple of years there. Okay. When he left Ephesus, where does he go? Look over to look over to Acts 19. over to Acts 19. See, Acts 19, he goes to Ephesus, right? See, Acts 19, verse 1, he's at Ephesus there. Acts 19, verse 1. And then all of chapter 19, it's about Ephesus. And then, that's where you have this great uproar that happened, where he, about Diana of the Ephesians. Look at chapter 20 now. And watch this. After the uproar ceased, Paul called unto him the disciples and embraced them and departed for to go where? So this could fit. 
Right? Yeah. Is there, everybody understand what we're saying? Mm -hmm. He says when he writes 1 Timothy, he says to Timothy, as I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia. Okay, so what, so Paul's at Ephesus, but he goes to Macedonia. Well, that's, that's, Acts, that's Acts 20 verse 1. So doesn't he write 1 Timothy there? Yes, no. Probably not, because this, this is where we said that he wrote Romans. What's that? This is where we said that he wrote Romans. Well, yeah, he, he, he writes 2 Corinthians basically around verse 1. He writes Romans in about verse 3. Yeah. So how would you know? Is this, is this confusing? How would you know? Did, did you say in Acts 19, 20, he was going to Macedonia? I said in Acts 20, verse 1. Look, look at Acts 20, verse 1. Was it having to do with the uproar? It could. Look at, uh, Beth, look at Acts 20, verse 1. Because in Acts 19, he's at Ephesus. Yeah. But in Acts 20, where is he going? <laughs> there it is. So what I'm saying is that you do see in the book of Acts, prior to Paul being in bonds in Rome, you do see that he was at Ephesus and he went to Macedonia. So you have to consider this as a possibility as to when he wrote 1 Timothy. There's the key right there. Oh my gosh. That's the key right there. Tom, you need to give a real, real nice big kiss for that, okay? <laughs> Go ahead and reach over. It's legal. She's married. You're married to her. Come on now. <laughs> Did you guys just see what she saw? That's the key right there. When he, in Acts 20, watch this now. In, stay with me in Acts 20. It says, And after the uproar, on the verse 1, after the uproar, was seized, Paul called unto him the disciples and embraced them and departed for to go to Macedonia. And when he had gone over those parts and had given them much exhortation, he came to Greece. There abode three months when the Jews laid wait for him as he was about to sail into Syria. He purposed to return through Macedonia and there accompanied him into Asia, Sopater of Berea and of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus and Segundus and Gaius of Derby and guess who? There's the, there's the clue right there. Is it in, in Acts 20, when Paul leaves Ephesus to go to Macedonia, there's no indication that he left Timothy at Ephesus or that he besought Timothy to stay. Timothy accompanied him over into Macedonia, into Greece, and then back up through Macedonia and then back to Asia. Whereas when you read over here, in uh, 1 Timothy 1, if you look back at 1 Timothy chapter number 1, look at this. 1 Timothy 1, 3, it says this. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia. So what, what do we learn from that verse that he asked Timothy to do relative to Ephesus? Stay to stay there. That doesn't fit the pattern that you see it, it actually happened in Acts 19 and 20. Okay? So that's why, yes, even though some say that it was possibility that he wrote it in Acts 20, it, it doesn't fit the pattern. Since when Paul writes 1 Timothy, he's not in bonds, then that would have to mean that Paul got out of prison sometime after Acts 28, and based upon that verse right there, made it back to Ephesus. And not only made it back to Ephesus, but made it over to Macedonia. <coughs> See that? So he's moving around. Now what do you suppose he did at Ephesus? You don't, by the way, you don't have to suppose. What did he do at Ephesus? What's that? Yeah, he, he, he sought to build up the saints and sought to edify them. When he got to Ephesus, what did he find? How were they doing? They all left. That, they were not doing well at all, were they? Look at what he says. Look at 1 Timothy 1, 3. He says, As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some 
that they teach no other doctrine. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which minister to questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and a faith unfaith, which some, I'm sorry, from which some have swerved, have turned, having swerved, have turned aside into vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of what? Okay, listen. When Paul got back to Ephesus, what did he find was happening within the group at Ephesus? There were some that were departing. And within the, within the Ephesians there, there were those who were desiring to be teachers of the law. They were basically wrongly dividing the word again. They were going back to the former program. You see that there? Mm -hmm. So think about the significance of that. If Paul writes the book of Ephesians while in prison at Rome, and let's say he's in prison for about two years, which Acts 28 says that, two years in his own hard house. So he writes the book, he sends the book out to the Ephesians. He gets out. He goes to Ephesus. What has happened? Isn't that interesting? The book of Ephesians that should have had just a tremendous impact on those folks and taken them into the heavenly places and clearly helped help them to clearly see their identity in Christ in the heavenly places. Some weren't satisfied with it. Some wanted to go back to the law. Now, why would you do that? The flesh, self-righteousness. Persecution. Possibly persecution. And what? They were being taught that. Well, I'm saying the some that were doing it were the ones teaching it. Oh, yeah. See that? What? Those who were teaching it. Well, false false teachers. False teachers. But why would they... How is it that you could get the book of Ephesians from Paul and then within two to, to maybe five years, maybe less than that, two to maybe three years, after getting the book, you have some, they swerved, some, teaching of the doctrine, some are designed to be teachers of the law. Tradition. Tradition is true. What else? The same reason preachers do it today. Meaning what? She said, money. Money is okay. It's interesting because in the book, in First Timothy, Paul clearly brings up the issue of finances. Okay, Jim, you were going to say something? Well, obviously it's no different than it is today. Yes. So it's, it's, if people don't respect Paul's ministry, they can easily yeah. go to other parts of the Bible yes. and get people yes. back and if you, not right with the Bible. Yes. Let me repeat that for the folks on the internet. And I, I think we've had some technical issues this morning with the PAL talk. But at any rate, for those listening on, on the YouTube, Jim's comment, similar to what Bernice said here, is that it's really the same thing today. If, if you don't see and appreciate the distinctive and separate ministry of the Apostle Paul, if you don't see and appreciate what he calls the revelation of the mystery, then the position you are going to go back to is the law. Because that's all you have if you still want to claim to be a Bible-believing Christian. You're going to revert back to the former program. Because it's scriptural. It's biblical. It's just not dispensationally correct. When you look at a couple of things as well again here in First Timothy, Look at verse 3. I'm going to emphasize a, a, a word all the way through this book. Verse 3 says, As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went to Macedonia, that thou mightest charge... What's the next word there? Some. Some. Jump down to verse 6. From which... Next word there. Some. Some. Look down at verse 19. Holding faith and a good conscience which what? No. Some having put away concerning faith. And so on. Go over to chapter uh, 4 real quick here. Go to chapter number 4. Watch this. Verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times... What's the next word there? No. Some 
shall depart from the faith. See that there? Look over, if you would, to chapter number, uh, let's see, 5 here. Oh, let's see. Look over to chapter number 5. Why am I not seeing the verse here? Where, where are we at there? Yeah, there, yeah exactly. thank you. Verse 15. He says, For some are already turned aside uh, after Satan. That was another one in there. Verse, uh, let's see. Look over to chapter 6. Look at what he says now at verse, right at the end of verse 2. 6 2. The last sentence of verse 2. He says, These things teach and exhort. If any man teach otherwise, and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. So that's a reference to Paul's ministry. <laughs> Watch verse 4. This is pretty hard. He is what? Proud, knowing nothing. But doting about questions and strifes of words, where have come with envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness from such shape. Withdraw thyself. See that concept there? They're using the wrong standard to determine whether or not God is blessing. Joseph, go ahead. On uh, uh, chapter 4, verse 1, when he says, latter times, what is he referring to? He, he's your... Okay, let me repeat the question. First of all, in chapter 4, verse 1, when he says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. He's confirming to Timothy the reason why these people are departing. It's because they were in the latter times. Remember, the some, 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 some. So by the time he gets chapter 4, he says, Hey, this is exactly what the Holy Spirit told us. Some in the part of faith, and they're doing it. So he's confirming that in their own lifetime, they were already in the latter times. And by the way, when he says the latter times, he's talking about the issue of the dispensation of grace. He's not talking about the prophecy program. Okay. But these some are believers, right? Yeah. 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 It would include that. There, there no doubt would have also been unbelievers because what happens is that when you have a church that departs from the truth, you know, presumably they could let anyone come in and be their preacher. But in the context here, it would certainly be indicative that these were people in the local assembly. And so, Rich, you had a question or a comment? Doesn't he end up saying all of the that, That's in 2 Timothy. We're going to get there. Yeah, yeah. When he, when he writes 1 Timothy, he says, some have departed, some have left, some are departed. And this is exactly what the Holy Spirit says. Some are going to depart, some are going to depart, some are going to depart. Look at how he closes the book. Chapter 6, chapter 6, verse 20. Chapter 6, verse 20. He says, O oh, Timothy, I mean, you can just see the heaviness of his heart that he says this with. O oh, Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science, falsely so called, which, there's the word some again, which some professing have erred. Concerning the faith, grace be with thee, amen. See that? So think about, again, Paul, when Paul wrote the book of Ephesians and Colossians and so forth, so forth and Philippians and Philippians, he's in bonds. He has received the rest of the revelation of the mystery, right? And so he puts that information out there in those books. He gets out of prison. So he's going to go back and see how the saints are doing. And when he gets to Ephesus, he finds that that great apostasy that the Holy Spirit spoke expressly about to Paul, that Paul wrote in, in 1 Timothy 4, he finds that, yeah, it's already hit at Ephesus. Some have departed. Some are teaching the law. Some, some, some. So he leaves Timothy at Ephesus on purpose for the purpose of trying to stem hold back the departure 
the, the, the apostasy. For the purpose of trying to help those that are at Ephesus and are, and are, are you know, because some are probably figuring out what's, what's going on here. This guy's teaching this, this guy's teaching that. What do we believe? So he, te he leaves Timothy there on purpose. Go back to 1 Timothy 1 there if you would. Go back to 1 Timothy 1. And watch specifically what he leaves Timothy there to do. He says, As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, and here's why, that thou mightest charge some that they do what? Teach no other doctrine. No other doctrine other than what doctrine? That's right. Not just Bible doctrine, but the revelation of the mystery. The doctrine that Christ gave to the Apostle Paul for this dispensation. The Word of God rightly divided. He says, verse 4, Now to give heed to fables and endless genealogies. Okay, so based upon that statement there, what do you know was happening at Ephesus, at the local assembly at Ephesus? So the, 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 these false teachers, the, the sum, were using fables and endless genealogies in conjunction with desiring to be teachers of the law, and hence were putting the believers back under the former purpose. Basically, they Yes, exactly what it was. It was just, just, letting, just saying it's all the same thing. Let me ask Go ahead. We think about fables as being children's stories, but what? But the doctrine that God gave to Israel. Yep. Now those are fables. They are over. The yes. The dispensation closed yeah. up. When, when that when that verse fables are Beth, that's an excellent point, excellent observation. That we tend to think of fables as like Aesop's fables and the children's story. By the way, you ever really read those fables to your kids? Oh, oh, that's terrible. Scary, big time. You know we're we're. Look, poor little Eve. Talking to my wife about that. It's, yeah, you know, we, we were reading it, the, 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 the fables to Evie the other, the other day, and the, the, cra the cradle falls, down will come baby cradle and all. Whoa! <laughs> anyway, so, so you're exactly right. The, the fables there, that's not that kind of fables. It's taking gospel of with Israel and making it into stories for the dispensation of grace with moral meanings to them. And hence putting us under that program. Same concept there. You know? What well, was the discussion and, about the genealogies? What's that? What, what, great, great question. And it says endless genealogies. In Israel's program, are genealogies significant and important? And if so, why and for what? The seed line. The seed line. Exactly right. The seed line. And not just the seed line of Christ. What else? The, the, seed, the priest, the 12 tribes, how to be identified with the true nation, the Davidic, it's the, the land, Davidic covenant. the Davidic covenant, all that. The, the issue of genealogies is significant in Israel's program, in the kingdom program on this earth. It is significant. So when you bring that over here to the dispensation of grace, the idea is, hey, if you all of a sudden can be tied in the seed line, now you're somebody kind of. That, that's what that, that, that's about. Yes, go ahead. Maybe that's where those doctrines, the, the body of Christ is coming down on white, it, it, on white corpses yeah. and all that. It, that it, it has its roots in all that. They want to have the body of Christ coming back to the earth and ruling the reign of Christ on the earth. Okay? So then he says at verse 4, Neither give he to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions. So see, th that ministers, it produces a lot of questions with no edification happening. Rather than godly edifying. The purpose of a local assembly is godly edifying. That verse tells you that right there. The purpose of a local assembly, the purpose of this Bible study, of this, of this church here, the purpose of any local assembly is to accomplish godly edifying. Amen. That's the purpose. He says, which is in faith, so do. Now the end of the commandment. When he says in the commandment, the idea that the, the goal of this charge, Timothy, that I'm giving you. Okay? The end of the commandment is this. Charity. Out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and faith in faith. That's what God the edifying is designed to produce in the believer. That is, a pure heart, a good conscience, and genuine faith. A genuine belief in what God is doing in the dispensation of grace. That's what it's designed to do. 
from, and he says, from which some having swerved have turned away into vain jangling, desire to be teachers of the law, and so forth. So you can see that if you leave the ministry and message that Christ gave to the Apostle Paul, and at the same time you still want to call yourself a Bible believer Christian, you're going to go, the only place to go to is Israel's program. And you're not going to be producing God the edifying. You're going to be producing a bunch of questions instead of helping people be built up in the faith. Okay, now, so my purpose this morning, first of all, was to, tell, to, to identify the fact that the Apostle Paul wrote, wrote 1 Timothy after he was released from prison. He goes to Ephesus. When he gets there, he finds exactly what the Holy Spirit told him about, that, hey, Paul, some are going to depart from the faith. He gets to Ephesus and he says, yep, that's exactly what I find. So he leaves Timothy there on purpose and that is to seek to continue the edification process along with those who will listen. Chapter 4, quickly. Look over to chapter 4. Look over to chapter number 4. And watch this, verse 16. He says, Take heed unto thyself. What's he mean by that? 4.16. Take heed unto thyself. Be you got to watch out for yourself. Is, is that true for us as well? Oh, yeah. Every single one of us as believers. We have to watch out. We have to be careful what we let ourselves listen to. Yeah. What we believe. What we're trusting. If, if Timothy, who had been taught directly by the Apostle Paul, and has these books written to him, if Paul tells him to take heed unto thyself, how much more so for you and me today? Sure. We need to be careful what we allow ourselves to believe. Okay? He says, Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. So you have to take heed to the doctrine. How often should you take heed to the doctrine? Daily. Daily. Exactly right. All the time. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Let me ask it a different way. How often does your mind wander? <laughs> Somebody else said, What? <laughs> you know? So you always got to bring yourself back. You always got to. What's that? Let every thought. Exactly. It is. It really is that. Yeah. Every thought. Bring every thought captive. Um, so he says, Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself. Save thyself from what in the context? Oh, the departure. The false doctrine, the confusion that was happening in Ephesus. And he says, save thyself and them that hear thee. Notice, them that, what? Hear, hear thee. Those that, listen to Those that listen to what Timothy would teach them. The doctrine will save us from apostasy if you hear it. Remember how Christ himself keeps saying the concept, let him that has ears to hear, hear. Yeah. you got to hear what it says. Faith cometh by hearing by the Word of God. Okay? Okay. So now, if you would, skip over 2 Timothy. This time, go to Titus now. This time, go to Titus. This time, go to Titus. And I'm going to start at verse 1. Let's try to... Think. So, Paul wrote 1 Timothy after he got out of that Roman imprisonment. And it's at a time when he's able to travel around. He, he finds as he's traveling around, things are exactly what the Holy Spirit said would happen, that some are going to depart from the faith or in the latter days. Okay? So watch Titus now. I'm going to start at verse um, 4. Titus 1, 4, he says, To Titus, mine own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. Now watch what he says here. For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. Okay, when you read the book of Titus, similar to the book of 1 Timothy, it certainly looks like Paul is, is free to travel around. He's not in bonds. How many times is Titus mentioned in the book of Acts? Who's got, anybody got a, a computer, quick sword searcher on your computer? Everybody, everybody does nowadays. 
Probably not. I don't think he is. Isn't that interesting? He's not mentioned at all in the book of Acts. He's obviously with Paul, it's just he's not mentioned in the book of Acts at all. Isn't that interesting? Now, when that verse says that he, he says uh, at verse 5, for this cause left I thee in Crete. You might remember where Crete was? That's south, southeast of Greece. It's an south, island. It's an island. Little, little island of uh, southeast of Greece. So that means if Paul left Titus at Crete and then Paul moves on, then where else must Paul have traveled to after he got out of, Rome, after he got out of prison in Rome? He must have gone to that island. When he gets to the island, he finds... Uh, that nothing set up functioning out at all. It's very different than Ephesus. When you compare the structure of the local assembly at Ephesus and the structure of the assembly at Crete, at Ephesus, remember Paul in Acts 19 goes to Ephesus, he builds a local assembly there, it's functioning, it's operational, it's going, there's order, there's structure, that type of thing. He goes away, winds up in prison in Rome, comes back to them, the thing's starting to break down. When he, when, he, when he writes to Titus at Crete, there had never been an organized, structured ministry there at Crete. Titus is set here to get things in order, almost from scratch, so to speak. My point is that he made it to Crete. He's going to move on. He leaves Titus there for the purpose of establishing order and structure and getting the ministry going kind of a thing. Go ahead, Jim. I, I, I ask you this once, but is, the audience is just me and Jim. Uh, on verse 12 of Titus, chapter 1, it says, One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, The Christians are always liars, evil beasts, and slow bellies. <laughs> and in verse 13, the first sentence. This witness is true. <laughs> so, that was his question. His question was, wait a minute. How, how, do you, how does he say... The Christians are always liars. Oh, but in this case, they're telling the truth. <laughs> and then that's what he's saying there. Yeah, the Christians were known for being liars and exaggerators and so forth. He says, and you know what? In this case, they're telling you the truth, what they're saying. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah. okay. so at any rate, when Paul writes Titus, writes to Titus, he's out of prison, he's not in bonds, he's traveling around. He leaves Titus here for the purpose of getting the ministry going, functioning, operations, and so forth. That's why some of the differences between what you read in, in 1 Timothy and, and Titus and so forth, okay? Titus would almost be used for a ministry that's just starting from scratch, going. Timothy would be used, kind of a ministry that maybe had been going and then kind of, kind of falls back a little bit and then kind of get it going again. So, something like that. that might be kind of a crude way to say that, but a little bit different there, okay? Now, I asked you to notice something last week and to do a little bit of homework. Go to chapter 3 of Titus. Look over to chapter 3 of Titus. Chapter 3, verse 12 says this. He says, When I shall send Artemis unto thee, or Tychicus, be diligent to come unto me to Nicopolis, for I have determined there to winter. And the question was, where is Nicopolis? I had, I had a couple of good uh, responses to email and so forth about that. And what makes this a little confusing, a little challenging, I should say, is that when you look at some notes about Decapolis and so forth, a few sources say that at that time, when, Paul, when Paul's writing those books historically, that there were at least six different locations that used the name uh, Decapolis. Mm. You understand why that? Question. How many Jerusalems are there? One. If you got a world map today, how many Jerusalems are there? There are at least two. There's one over in the Middle East and there's one in the United States in Utah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> what I'm saying? How, how many different cities are there. Th think about the names of cities in the United States that originated from their name in Europe. Oh, wow. Just a whole wow. bunch of cities oh, up in the Northeast. Yeah. Right? When the, when the colonists came over from Europe, they brought the name of their cities with them. New 
Hemshire. That's for Europe, kind of a concept. Those cities up in Maine and so forth. And so you can understand how it would be so that in Paul's day, several cities might use the name Nicopolis. And, and that evidently does in fact seem to be the case. So it, it looks like there are two possible two possibilities of which one Paul is making reference to. One is over around Macedonia. And one is uh, 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 see, on the eastern side of Macedonia, from mm. up in Trace, T-R-A-C-E. Yeah. The other one is actually on the western side of Achaia, right on the coastline. Those are the two prominent ones. Yeah. I'm trying to, I don't know which one it was. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Jim, go ahead. Well, if, if you take the position that Paul made it to Spain, it would be more likely that he was on, on the west coast of yeah. Macedonia. That's exactly where I'm going with that. Okay. So, so you're exactly right. Let me repeat for what Jim said for the internet. No, no, there's no need to apologize for that. That is a reasonable conclusion to come to. And the comment that Jim made was that if, if Paul based upon the comment in Romans 15 that he wanted to get to Spain, and then when he writes 2 Timothy, he says, I finished my course, it's reasonable to believe that he made it to Spain. If that's the case, then the Nicopolis that he's making reference to reasonably could be considered to be the one on the western coast of Achaia because he's on his way over there. And that, that certainly makes sense completely. So Jim, I, I, I think you're exactly right there. Okay, no need to apologize, man. That's exact, That's excellent thinking there. Tom, go ahead. I was thinking too, he's going there in the winter, he would probably go south Southern you would think so, yeah. Another comment that Tom made was the idea that uh, the difference between the elevation level of, up in Macedonia compared to Achaia, if he's going to winter there, he'd probably want to stay somewhere maybe it's more, more conducive to uh, maybe not freezing and so forth. But uh, so those, anyway, it, it does seem, and, and regardless of which one it is, and, and by the way, and I'm not saying it's not important because it is, because it's in, in the scripture there, but I'm saying Paul obviously was free, he's traveling around, he's, he's going somewhere. So think about it this way. He gets out of prison. You know for sure based upon, upon 1 Timothy, he goes to Macedonia. I'm sorry, he goes to e Ephesus, so that's in Asia. Then you know he leaves Timothy there. Then he goes up to Macedonia. And then you know he got to Crete, which is south of Achaia. And then he's in Nicopolis. And then he's going to go to Spain. So almost certainly it's the Nicopolis on the western side of Achaia. Mm -hmm. He is moving around. He's getting the ministry out. He's seeking to edify and encourage the saints. Okay? And then one last thing here. Um, now go with me to 2 Timothy. We're not going to finish this this morning. Surprise, surprise, surprise. But let me just see if you, have you notice some things about 2 Timothy now. 2 Timothy. <laughs> When, when Paul writes 2 Timothy, is he back in bonds? And if so, how do you know? When Paul writes 2 Timothy, is he back in bonds? And if so, how do you know? When he said to Timothy, Timothy, don't be ashamed of my bonds. Yes, that idea there. Look, look over several references in 2 Timothy. Watch 2 Timothy. If you, were, if you would, 2 Timothy chapter 1, 16. He says, The Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus, for he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of what? My chain. But when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently and found me. See, Paul's in bonds when he's writing this book. Yeah. He says in chapter 2, verse 8, he says, Remember that Jesus Christ, the seed of David, was raised from the dead according to my gospel, wherein I suffered trouble as an evildoer, even unto what? Bonds. But the word of God is not bound. See, when he's writing this book, he's back in bonds. Look over, if you would, to chapter 4. Look over to chapter 4, and he says this. Verse 6. 
For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. When he writes this book, what does he know for sure is going to happen to him? Yes. Yeah, he's not getting out this time. Actually, he is, but just in a different way. <laughs> okay. He's going to change the location. Is that, is that what you said, Ann? He's yes. going to dramatic change of location. Yeah, that's right. When he says time to be offered, it almost sounds like a sacrifice. Yeah, that's exactly right. The comment that Beth made, he says the time uh, uh, to be offered is almost like a sacrifice. That, that, that not, not a sacrifice for sins, but he's just giving himself up because of what he believes. Yes, exactly what that is meant to be there. Yeah, so good observation there. Okay. Notice what else he says. Um, look down at verse 9 of chapter 4. Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. Jump down to verse 13. The cloak that I left at Troas with covers. Whoa, well the net verse tells you he had made it also to Troas. That's that passageway from Asia over into Macedonia. He had been there while he was free. The cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus, when thou, when thou comest, bring with thee and the books, especially the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did mean much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works, of whom be thou where also, for he hath greatly restored our works. What does he tell Timothy right there? Man, you better steer clear of this guy. You got to, man, this guy's trouble. Isn't that fascinating? Look in the same book, verse 21. Same chapter. Do thy diligence to come. What's he say there? Okay, so put all that together. When the Apostle Paul's writing 2 Timothy, he's in bonds, he's back in prison, he's not getting out this time. He doesn't have his cloak, it's cold. Winter's approaching, Timothy. I, I could use that coat. That coat you, I need you to bring. Okay, imagine that. When when Paul says here in in Second Timothy, look at chapter four again. Well, what a, what a sad verse. Just a heavy heart for Paul. Verse eleven says, "Only Luke is with me." When you come to the end of Paul's ministry in life, but what does it look like? He's been abandoned. It looks like a failure. <laughs> Total failure and abandoned by all but just a few that you can count on one hand. So therefore, if we were to look at circumstances, what would you also have to conclude about God's quote unquote blessing Paul? God taking care of Paul. You'd have to say that God totally abandoned him. Just like the world, Joseph being in prison, right? What was he? What was he thinking? Yeah. For three years, I think it was great. Even longer than that. Yeah, three and a half years. But the picture was: What happened to this man's God? What happened to all these people that Paul led to the Lord? Tom, go ahead. It's like the world looks at the cross. Yes, it is, isn't it? So, like the world looks at the cross today. Yes, uh, Steve, go ahead. It sounds like he's still got a bunch of brothers with him there in verse 21. That will speak of the Jews and minus right there. Where's that? Yeah, verse 21 of chapter 4. He says, Do thy diligence to come before winter. Eubulus, Eubulus, greet thee, and Pudens, and Linus, and Claudia, and all the brethren. So, like I say, they're with him. It's just a handful at best. Isn't that interesting? And he does say only Luke is with me. Go ahead, Jim. And is that Luke? Is that the Luke? Is there are there many Lukes in the Bible, or is that the Luke that wrote? Luke? Yes. The the question is is the Luke in four eleven? Is that the Luke who wrote the book of Luke and the book of Acts? Yes. The beloved yeah. physician. Yeah, the beloved physician. Yeah, which also tells you Paul was probably not healthy. Okay, and so forth. So, when, I want to give you a homework assignment because we're out of time, but your homework assignment is, is this for next week. I want you to read 2 Timothy. Read it through a few times this week, if you would. 
2 Timothy is the last thing that the Holy Spirit has Paul write before his execution. It's the last book to become scripture and so forth. Um, if what's the left if if you knew you were going to die in, in two weeks or a month even, and you could just say a few things to the people that were important to you, what would you tell them? And I want you to read 2 Timothy from that perspective. Because Paul in 2 Timothy says some key things. It's like he takes and, his, and summarizes his whole ministry into a few key issues and reminds Timothy that, Timothy, listen, if I whittle everything down to the most essential important issues, here they are. Keep the doctrine. So, yeah, so think about that. Read the book that way. <laughs> what would you say? And then what did he say? Beth, go ahead. I wanted to ask, of course, Luke got saved in Israel's program. So, did he just have a heart to go and, and help Paul? Well, you know, when he well, two things about that. The first statement was Luke got saved in Israel's program. You don't necessarily know that that was true. true. You don't know for sure when and where Luke did get saved. Okay. Oh. Um, and I'm not saying he didn't get saved in his program. I'm saying I don't know what verse I would go to to say Luke specifically was saved as a member of the little flock. I don't know what verse I would go to to say that. I know the verses that, that would certainly suggest an idea. Okay? Such as the way he begins Luke and begins Acts and so forth. Um, Judas, about is, the Judas is one of those. So, the hold on a second. So, so, back to your question about the idea of did he just, he, he just loved the Word of God is what he did. And so even if he was saved in the kingdom program part of the little flock, which he was, then he would have stayed in that program, but he was a man who clearly saw the change and labored together with Paul in that message. Okay. So you don't notice any others that did that? Very few. Very few. He mentions a few in Colossians. Yeah. Okay. And uh, uh, Marty, you had a comment? Oh, no. I was saying that, you know, the Lord said, haven't I chosen 12 of you and one of you? Yes, one well, left. Uh, yes, yeah. So, okay. you know. Yeah. Okay, so you have your homework assignment for next week. Let's take a break. We'll start in a few minutes here, okay? Thank you.